Now that we've talked about Renter at Lock, we can go further and talk about the companion class that's often used in conjunction with Renter at Lock. Not always. Renter at Lock is more common, but condition objects often used in conjunction. And in fact, condition object requires a Renter at Lock. So you have to understand Renter at Lock before you can understand condition object. So I'll talk about what a condition variable is. A condition object is an implementation of a condition variable in the same way that a uh, Rentrant lock was an implementation of a, rentrant, of a recursive mutex, right? So you have the concept of recursive mutex. Rentrant lock implements that. We have a concept of condition variable that condition object implements in Java. And I'll also talk about the pattern that is implemented, which is called the, the uh, guarded suspension pattern. Condition objects are arguably the most tricky thing we've covered to this point. So uh, I recommend you go back and rewatch this lesson, maybe read some of the links. And it, it definitely takes some head scratching. It's very, very cool. Once you get the pattern, it's not too hard, but it's subtle. And the reason why it's subtle is a bunch of moving parts. So what is a condition variable? A condition variable is a synchronizer that allows a thread to potentially repeatedly suspend its execution until a particular condition becomes true. And the way I like to think about this is a reentrant lock is sort of a way of keeping other threads at bay while you do your thing in the critical section. That's what kind of what a rentrant lock is about. A condition object is almost the other way around. It's a way to put yourself to sleep or keep yourself at bay, let other things do their, their thing, other threads do their thing, and then when the world changes to be more to your liking, then you get a chance to try again. So it's almost the opposite, right? One keeps others at bay, Reentrant locks, condition objects keep yourself at bay. But this idea is you may have to do this thing repeatedly. So that's why it's like the, uh, the Wheel of Pain from Conan the Barbarian. It took me a long time to find this video clip, by the way. <clears throat> a thread whose execution is suspended on a condition variable is said to be blocked on the condition variable. So while you're unable to make forward progress, you will voluntarily relinquish your processing in a thread of control and let something else run. So you're basically suspending yourself. And again, I, I found a cool image from uh, Conan the Barbarian where Conan suspended, right? OK, condition variables are implemented as a queue of threads that wait for a certain condition or certain conditions to become true before they can start to run again. So think of like a queue of threads waiting to do their thing and they're waiting on the condition variable for something to happen. And as we'll see later when we look into this in more detail, there's a bunch of pieces that are involved here. Uh, you can read about this at this Wikipedia link. You can read about condition variables in the context of monitors. The queue of threads that are waiting for their turn to run are often called the wait set, which is kind of a funny name. Um, but that's when people talk about the wait set, that's what they mean. They mean a queue of threads that are waiting for their chance to run. Condition variables are often used when mutual exclusion alone, not along, that's a typo, when mutual exclusion alone is inadequate. Um, and when I made these slides many years ago, it was kind of funny to remind us about Al Franken. Now all of a sudden he's not so funny anymore, right? But back in the day he was funny. And he would always feel inadequate if you ever watched his classic Stuart Smalley get on Saturday Night Live. In fact, one of the funniest ones was when Stuart Smalley was this sort of, you know, caring nurturer who had attended many 12-step programs and would help people with their problems. And he has Michael Jordan, the basketball player, come on his show one time. And it's really funny because he keeps trying to get Michael Jordan to admit that he feels inadequate, you know, and he's a loser and he's going to miss the shots at the end of the game and people are going to hate him. And Michael's like, no, I actually feel pretty confident I'm going to make those shots, you know. Poor Stuart just loses his mind because he, he can't deal with somebody who's so confident. But anyway, there are situations where mutual exclusion alone is not adequate. One situation is if you're going to end up spinning, right, you can just burn CPU resources. So that's a good example of the inadequacy of mutual exclusion alone, right? And another thing is uh, mutual exclusion is often insufficient to ensure coordination, or at least efficient coordination. I found this funny uh, 
cartoon. It's this is the center for the chronically uncoordinated. And the guy's like trying to ring the bell, but he's pushing it the wrong place on the doorframe. Um, so the real issue here is what to do when a, a thread encounters some shared state that uh, it can't do any work on yet. So what's an example of that? Remember we were talking before about the array blocking queue, and we had this concept of a, of a list. And I showed you the situation where you come along to take something from the blocking queue, but there's nothing in the queue yet. Well, that's a great example where you really can't do anything until there's something in the queue, right? So are you going to spin? Well, that's a bad idea. Um, you, you can access this shared state mutually exclusively using a rancher lock, but so what? You need to be able to do something to park yourself and wait until that thread, until some other thread comes along and puts something in the queue for you to take. So waiting on an empty list is an example of something where you really can't make any forward progress until the state changes in some way, like having something in the list. And uh, this is something, a little piece of graffiti I always thought was funny. I'll be right back, Godot. So anybody who's read existential philosophy will, will find that like uproariously funny. I can tell there's not many existential philosophers in the class. That's okay. It's okay. There's still time. So uh, you have to do something with this liberal arts background, right? And making obscure inside jokes is about the only way you can use it. Um, so implementing guarded suspension with condition variables. So condition variables are most often used to implement the guarded suspension pattern. And of course, you know, I was actually just watching this last night. I was trying to find a, an image to indicate guarded suspension. So what better than Gandalf holding off the Balrog on the bridge at Kazakh Doom? And uh, he's like, no, you shall not pass, right? And uh, of course, in computer terminology, you, you often say that for a while, and then you eventually let the thing pass because the conditions are met. Um, maybe it's more like the, the trolls and the billy goat gruff fable or something. But anyway, that's, that's what I'm using as my symbol for guarded suspension. So guarded suspension applies to operations that can run only after certain conditions or certain things have happened. So let's take a look at an example here. We're going to do some processing. We're going to do some work. But we can't do this work until some condition is satisfied. And so the way this works with condition variables is a lock must be acquired. So you have to have exclusive access to some critical section. A precondition must be satisfied, like there's something in the queue, for example. And a thread, in this case thread T1, will suspend its execution voluntarily on a condition variable until some other thread notifies it that the shared state that's part of the condition it's waiting for has been satisfied such that it may be true. And the, the key thing here is may be true. So it's tentative. Is it true? Is it not true? We're going to have to find out. Don't worry if you're still a bit mystified. This is the part that makes it tricky. But it's, it's really simple. It just requires thinking about multiple pieces. So the way this works is the lock has to be acquired. And then the precondition is checked most often in a loop, and we'll talk about why you have to be in a loop later, with the lock held. So the lock is held, we check the condition, and as long as the condition is not satisfied, like as long as the queue is empty and we're trying to take something from the queue, as long as that condition is not satisfied, we're going to call condition.await. We'll talk more about the relationship between condition and lock later when we get into the details. But the basic point is here that you end up, you, the thread, thread T1, voluntarily put yourself to sleep and atomically release the lock. This is not entirely clear by looking at this piece of code here, but when a wait is called, it does two things. It atomically releases the lock and it goes to sleep on the condition object, condition variable, waiting for some other thread to come along and change the state somehow, such that if this thread were to awaken and reacquire the lock automatically, it might have a shot at being able to find that condition satisfied. Assuming all those things happen, and the guarded suspension is eventually true, then we continue doing the operation after the guard. So this part here, the while condition not satisfied, condition dot await, 
That's the guarded suspension. And once that's satisfied, then you can make progress and, and do stuff. And notice that when you're doing stuff, the lock is held. So you have exclusive access to that critical section of code. Another thread, the TN, can signal or notify that the condition has changed, thereby waking up one or more other threads that are waiting on the condition on variable in order to give them a shot at checking to see whether or not the condition is now satisfied. When this happens, when a thread is awakened, so after one thread, say thread TN, signals the condition object, that will cause another thread, let's say this guy over here, to be awakened. And in that case, with the lock held, it'll then check to see if the condition is satisfied or not. And if so, then it falls through. If not, it goes back to sleep again. And that's why I talked before about repeatedly checking these things, right? Like the tree of, like the, uh, the wheel of uh, pain, right? You're repeatedly doing this over and over and over again until you finally get released. Now, the condition that you're checking for, this thing here, can be arbitrarily complicated. So it can be a method call. It can be an expression involving shared state. Sometimes it's both, and sometimes it's a method call, where the method call is checking to see the shared state. You know, there's a bunch of things you can do. And that always has to be um, protected by the lock. So the lock always has to be held whenever this condition is tested to see whether or not it's satisfied or not. <clears throat> Waiting on the condition variable releases the lock and suspends the thread atomically. So as we said before, when a wait is called, that automatically releases the lock and at the same time atomically puts the thread to sleep on the wait set, which is what the condition variable is doing. Thread one is suspended until thread n, some other thread, doesn't be thread n, some other thread will signal the condition variable. So thread one, it goes to sleep. And when it signals it, it'll wake it back up again. And then it has to reacquire its lock. OK, so this is basically just kind of walking through these things. It's a bit redundant here. Um, but that's the basic sequence of things. Joe. So, ah, great point. Great question. So the key thing to note here is that when you're asleep, let's see, let's see if we can go find, all right, when you call a wait, you atomically release the lock, go to sleep, and then someone else comes along because the lock is released, of course, they can lock it, do something, let's say put some elements in the queue, uh, and then signal and say, okay, the queue's not empty anymore. That will then cause a wait to wake up, or sorry, the, the thread that's blocked in a wait will wake up, reacquire the lock. So when a wait returns, the lock is always held. Really important to understand that stuff. And it's not at all clear when you look at the code. You're like, what the heck? Because a wait is actually doing two things. When you call a wait the first time, atomically, the await call is putting you to sleep and releasing the lock. And then when a wait is signaled, before before it returns, it reacquires the lock and then lets the thread go and check the condition again, or loop back around again and check it. We'll see later when we talk about the complexity. The complexity here is the moving parts. There's multiple moving parts, and that's what makes it hard to reason about. All right, so that, now that you've learned a little bit about what a condition variable is, let's talk about how condition variables are often applied in practice. We still haven't got to condition objects, which are the Java implementation of said condition variables, but you'll at least get the bigger concept. And I'll give you a fun, hopefully we'll have time to talk about a fun human known use of condition variables that'll help you remember how to use them. So condition variables turn out to be very powerful, but they're also somewhat hard to understand and hard to apply correctly because there's uh, complexity. Um, I've thought for a long time about why it's hard to understand this stuff. And I think one of the biggest issues is there's several moving parts involved. And so one of the common things you see is um, the fact that you have to work both with a lock and a condition variable or object. And you have to use those things together. And here's a nice diagram that looks more complicated than it really is that shows the way in which these things work. And so I'll run through this very quickly. 
and kind of give you a, an intuitive understanding of what this is talking about. So let's assume for sake of argument, we've got our array blocking Q. And we'll assume without loss of generality that the array blocking Q starts out empty. And we'll also assume that some thread comes along that wants to remove something from the array blocking Q. So client thread T1 comes along and it calls some synchronized method. And that synchronized method is going to be take. So it's what it's going to do is that will acquire the monitor lock, which is available since there's no other threads involved. And it'll try to go ahead and take something off the queue. Well, the queue is empty. So what we have to do is we have to go ahead and wait on the monitor condition, on the condition variable. And if you recall, that will atomically suspend thread T1 and release the monitor lock. So now we're talking about moving parts, right? There's multiple things going on. So this guy's basically parked off to the side, waiting for someone to come along and put something in the queue so it can finish taking it from the queue. Thread T2 comes along. It calls put, which is also a synchronized method. That goes and acquires the lock, which was released because we released it when we did the wait up here. And then it does some work. And the work it's going to do, of course, is it's going to put something on the queue. So now with a lock held, so it's atomic, it puts an item on the queue. And then it says, anybody waiting on the not empty condition is free to wake up. And then as this thread T2 exits the critical section, it releases the lock. So the lock is now released, and it's notified some other thread, if there is one, that it has a chance to maybe make some forward progress. That notify method will come along here and discover someone's parked on its wait set on this not empty condition wait set. That will end up reawakening that thread, which will reacquire the lock in wait before it returns. And then it'll loop back around again, and it'll say, aha, now there's something in the queue. And it knows this with the lock held. And it will go ahead and take the item off the queue. And then it will go ahead and release the lock and continue on its merry way. So this is a snippet of code that's showing what happens when different threads try to coordinate with some shared state, which was in this case the queue state, like the count and the number of elements in the queue and so on, using a monitor lock, which is a reentrant lock for our purposes in Java, and a monitor condition, which for this particular example would be a single monitor condition that would be the not empty condition. Now, in reality, it's actually even more complicated than this because we also have to keep track of the not full case, but that's another use case for another time. So anyway, that's, that's what's going on. That's how to think about this. And the non-determinism of concurrency is a bit tricky, because it may turn out that when someone wakes you up to try to check to see if the queue is not full, or sorry, the queue is not empty, between the time when you're awakened and when you get a chance to acquire the lock, some other thread may scoot in there and grab it and run off with it. In which, and of course, that would have also had to have acquired the lock. And the lock is happy to do that. It's sort of first come, first serve. So whoever gets there first will get a chance to, to get that lock. So it's often the case that you don't know if you really got the resource, even though somebody woke you up. And that's why you typically have to have a loop, because you may have to loop multiple times to keep checking to see if your condition was satisfied. And if you're still a bit befuddled by that, take a look at the Stack Overflow article I cite here, which gives you more discussion about why you have to use these things in a loop typically. Not always, but most of the time. So therefore, because of the fact they're complicated, we often kind of hide them within other abstractions. So condition variables are very useful, but you very rarely access them directly. They're usually hidden behind other things that you'll find in uh, Java. So for example, blocking queues and decks use condition objects, but they don't expose them to you as, a as the application programmer. You do puts and takes, typically. Um, array blocking queue is a classic example of this. They have a pair of condition variables, not full and not empty, which we'll look at next time. And those condition variables or condition objects share a common lock. Java also has built-in monitor objects, which come as part of their built-in monitor object features. So things like wait, notify, and so on, notify all. Those are all things that are baked in. And you typically end up accessing these things using something called the monitor object pattern, which is from a book I wrote many years ago. You can find a paper that describes it here. 
it kind of talks about how you can use monitor objects to synchronize access and coordinate access of multiple threads through a shared object. Very, very, very common way to deal with uh, synchronization in certain portions of Java, specifically the things that are sort of using shared, shared memory or shared variables to coordinate with multiple threads. OK, so one of my favorite examples is the human known use of conditioned variables. So again, it's a little bit unintuitive. A lock is pretty easy. Remember when we talked about locks, we talked about going into the restroom in an airplane where you have the fully bracketed protocol. You wait until that you queue up, waiting until the little sign on the door says vacant. You then go in, you close the lock. It says occupied. People have to queue up till you're done, and you open the door and leave. So that's the metaphor for that. Remember for semaphores, we talked about the bag full of beach volleyballs in Corona Del Mar in Southern California, right? So you got a bag of balls that we use in order to coordinate teams accessing a volleyball court. Condition variables are a little bit more complicated. So I have to set up the story, and I'll, I'll try to make this quick. We have about five minutes, six minutes left. So basically, the way that this works is that um, imagine that you decide uh, to make some extra money, you're going to deliver pizzas. Right? Pizza is a great thing because it's uh, recession proof. Right? When times are good, people eat pizza. When times are bad, people eat pizza. So it's kind of a recession proof thing. And the way this is going to work, you and some of your friends are going to go to you know, Papa John's or whatever. And the protocol is as follows. Uh, if there's a pizza to be delivered, then the person in the, you know, the waiting area for the pizza deliverers has to get two things. They have to get a pizza, and they have to get the keys to the delivery truck in order to deliver the pizza. And if they only have one thing, then they can't actually do anything. So they got to get the pizza, and they got to get the keys, right? Um, so the way the protocol is going to work is because you know, you're working a second job, you're tired, when you're not actually out delivering pizzas, you're going to sleep. So you're going to sit in this little room and Papa John's in the back, and you're going to sleep. And whenever someone returns the pizza truck you know, after doing the delivery, they're going to put the keys on a hook and ring a bell. Likewise, whenever the, the chef finishes cooking a pizza, they're going to put that pizza in a box on the counter and ring a bell. So whenever you hear a bell, you're going to wake up, and you're going to try to grab a pizza and grab the keys. And if you get both of those things, then you can go ahead and deliver the pizza in the truck. However, if you get the keys, but you know there's no pizza yet, you have to give up the keys and go back to sleep, because you can't you don't have all the resources you need in order to be able to make forward progress. So the fancy way of saying that is your, your conditions have not been satisfied, right? The conditions you were waiting on, which involved multiple things, keys and pizza, were not both satisfied. So you have to release the resources and go back to sleep. So that's one thing. You can only make forward progress when you get all the resources you need. Otherwise, you have to sleep. The other important thing to remember is uh, if you're doing this kind of code, all the waiters, all the threads that are participating in this little protocol, have to acquire the resources in the same order. What would happen if the bell went off, someone grabbed the keys, someone else grabbed the pizza, and then they both tried to get the other resource? What's the fancy name for that? Deadlock, right. So that's a bad situation. That's circular waiting, right? And neither one will give it up. So you have to make sure you wait in the same order. So that's the, the metaphor to think about with respect to using condition variables. You've got to have multiple resources, you've got to acquire them in the right order, and um, that will then ensure that you can grab the pizza truck and deliver the pizza. Okay, so that is the